I was scared this sin of pornography and lust was gonna keep me from the international calling that was on my life to preach the gospel. Worldly sorrow focuses on us, on me, okay? What are the consequences I'm gonna have to face? Am I gonna lose my marriage? Am I gonna lose my position in ministry? Am I gonna lose my job? Am I gonna be judged? Godly sorrow, on the other hand, focuses on him. I've hurt the heart of the one I love so much. You have to be really honest. What is your motive for wanting to be free? If your motive is number one, first and foremost, I am hurting the heart of God, then you're gonna get free. Hey, welcome to lesson two of Porn Free. Again, I can't tell you how proud I am of each and every one of you that's watching this course. Um, I, I just hope that right now it's just like me sitting across the table talking to you. That's the way I feel in my heart. I literally can just sense your presence and your desire and your passion to be free. I just wanna commend your bravery. I wanna commend your humility. And I wanna tell you how much I love and deeply care for you. And that's because God deeply loves and cares for you. He is your father. So in this lesson, we're going to address the motivation for wanting to be free. I had the wrong motivation and it kept me from getting free. And I really wanna expose this to you to help you to understand why it is so important that we have the right motive. So, as I shared with you in the first lesson, I got introduced to pornography right around the age of 12. I, it was magazines, it wasn't tablets, it wasn't computers, it wasn't uh, phones, it was magazines. So I started getting the Playboys, the Hustlers, the Penthouses. I just repeatedly kept looking at these magazines every month they came out. Me and my friends figured out how to get the new magazines. And by the time I was in high school, I was eaten up with lust. By the time I got to college, now I'm in a fraternity. You talk about adding fuel to the fire. It's unbelievable. You're on the varsity tennis team. So you're a, a D1 university athlete and girls are interested. And I mean, everything is going wrong. Everything is going down the road to destroy my life. And then when I finally got saved my sophomore year in college and I thought, okay, everything's gonna go out of my life. It's all leaving. Well, the interesting thing was I cussed like a, a drunken sailor. I couldn't construct a sentence without cussing. It left my, li my life the day I got saved. Uh, alcoholism left my life, but, but the pornography addiction didn't. And I remember when I got married to Lisa, I thought it would go away, but it didn't, and it got worse, and it was affecting our relationship in the bedroom and outside of the bedroom. And so um, in 1984, I was now working for a church in Dallas, Texas. We had 450 paid employees. We were one of the biggest, well, best known churches in the United States. So every major ministry was coming into our church. And my job was, I pick, picked up the guest speakers and I took care of them. And one of the men that came to our church frequently was a man who probably had the most powerful deliverance ministry in the world in the 20th century, and his name was Dr. Lester Summerall, and he was a very strong man, very gruff man, but he really cared in, about people. He deeply cared for me, I knew that. So I felt safe to open up to him. So it was September of 1984, and I said, Dr. Summerall, I am bound. And I remember him looking at me and going, stop it, and I was like, it, I kind of reverberated from him saying it, and then he started preaching to me. Now, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, he was really strong with me, but I knew he cared, so I listened. And when he was finished, I listened to every word he had to say. I said, Dr. Summerall, would you please pray for me? I, I want deliverance. I want this thing out of my life forever. He said, absolutely, John, come close. And he laid his hands on my head and he prayed a really strong prayer, right? You know what happened? Nothing. Let me be more specific. Absolutely nothing. Well, I guess I better find another pastor. No, you're not gonna find anybody with more power and authority than Dr. Summerall in that day. So <clears throat> I'm baffled. I, I humbled myself. I'm, I'm like, what's going on? But nine months later, so this was the fall of 1984. I think it was September, October. Let's just say September of 1984. Nine months later, May of 1985, I went on a four-day fast. And on the fourth day of that fast, May 6th, 1985, I got completely, totally set free from lust and pornography and I'm still free today. And I'm gonna say it again, it is wonderful to live free. I have been in bondage and I am free and free is so much better. And that's where you're going. But 
I'm walking in this freedom for a couple years and I have this nagging question I just can't shake. And so I finally brought it to the Lord one morning in prayer and I said, Father, I just don't understand. I really humbled myself with Dr. Summerall. I opened up with him. I did what the word of God said. Why didn't I get delivered in September of 1984? Why wasn't it until nine months later that I got delivered? And God, interestingly enough, started showing me my prayer life. Now, I got to back up a little further. In 1982, I read a book by E.M. Bounds called The Power of Prayer. And I was so impacted by that book that I made up my mind, okay, I'm going to pray every single morning. And so what I did is I set my alarm for 445 every single morning. And I was out of bed and I was outside in a remote place by 5 a.m. And I would pray from 5 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. every single day. And then I'd get back to my apartment and go to work by 8. Now, when you, have a, when you pray 90 minutes every single morning outside in a remote place, so you, know, you don't have a Bible to read, you're out there talking to God and trying to listen for 90 minutes, right? Well, you run out of things to pray about. So you have what I like to call your default prayer. Now, what is your default prayer? That is the thing you want more than anything else. And my default prayer was, God used me to lead multitudes to Jesus. God used me to heal sick people. God used me to get people set free. Man, I'd pray sometimes outside. I'd say, God, I'd scream this out, give me souls or I'm going to die, right? You know, because I knew the old timer said it, so I'm trying to do it. I'm a young man here, you know. And so um, I remember one morning, and I don't know if it was September of 1984 or October, but it was right in the same time period that I opened up with Dr. Summerall. I'm outside praying, and God says this to me. He said, son, your prayers are off target. Now, I remember when I heard that, I was like, what? I'm praying that people get saved, people get healed? What do you mean my prayers are off target? And then the Lord said this to me. He said, son, you can, you can get people set free. You can heal people in Jesus' name. You can get people saved and end up in hell forever. Okay, when I heard that, and I heard it so clear, I thought, this is the devil. This is the devil. But yet I knew it was God. So then he said something to me I'd never thought of, never read, never heard anyone else say. Because our church talked about faith, about receiving from God, about the blessings. We never talked about stuff like this. But he said something to me I'd never thought of or heard before. And he said this to me, and he said it in a pleading voice. He said, son, Judas left everything he had to come follow me for three and a half years. Judas healed the sick in my name. Judas got people free in my name. Judas preached repentance in my name. Judas is in hell forever. Wow. When he said that, I started trembling. And I remember very cautiously, I said, then what should be my number one prayer? And the Lord said, to know me intimately. And I thought about it that day. That was Moses' number one heart cry. He finished well. That was King David's number one heart cry. He finished well. That was the Apostle Paul's number one heart cry. To know him in the power of his resurrection. He finished well. So my prayer started changing. And I started praying this as my default prayer. God, I want to know you the best a man can know you. God, I want to please you the best a man can please you. God, I want to love you as deeply as a man can love you. I want to know your heart. I want to, I want to love what you love, and I want to hate what you hate. What is important to you, I want it to become important to me. What is not so important to you, I want it not so important to me. And I start crying this out. You say, John, what does this have to do with you getting set free from pornography? It has everything to do with it. Because Paul makes a statement. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, speaking to the Corinthian church, he said, For godly sorrow, now, now listen to this, godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Now, the Greek word there for salvation is the Greek word soteria, which means healing, preservation, soundness of mind, or deliverance. So don't think just die and go to heaven. It means all of that. So we're talking deliverance here. Let's put deliverance in there. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to deliverance not to be regretted. But now listen to this, but sorrow of the world produces death. So we have two sorrows. Now guys and ladies, listen to me. They are both genuine sorrows. It's not one sorrow is authentic and one sorrow is imitation. They're both very real sorrows. They're authentic, okay? Now, what's the difference? Because one 
produces, or, or produces the repentance that leads to deliverance. The other one produces death. What's the difference between these two sorrows? Well, you can see it in the life of two kings in the Bible. King Saul, he disobeys God. And let me tell you this, all sin is disobedience to God. If you look at Adam, Adam didn't jump in bed with a prostitute. He didn't look at pornography in the garden. He just disobeyed God. This is the this is the root, okay, the root of all sin. Saul disobeys God. The prophet Samuel comes to him and backs him into the corner. And, fi- and that's what prophets do. And finally, when, when, when he's backed into the corner and Saul realizes there's no getting out of this because he tried to blame the people, he tried to make excuses, all this, Saul goes, I have sinned. But the next words out of his mouth were these, yet now honor me. Samuel in front of my leaders and my people. In other words, you've embarrassed me. So the focus of his sorrow was himself. If you look at King David, King David commits adultery. In order to cover up the adultery, he murders the woman's husband. This is unthinkable. But when the prophet comes to him, the prophet Nathan, and backs him into the corner, David goes, I've sinned against the Lord, and falls on his face and stays on his face for seven days. And he couldn't care less what his leaders and what the people thought. And you hear his heart cry when he cries out in the book of Psalms and he says, God, against you and against you only have I sinned. The focus of his sorrow was God. Worldly sorrow focuses on us, on me. Okay, what are the consequences I'm going to have to face? Am I going to lose my marriage? Am I going to lose my position in ministry? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be judged? Am I going to burn in hell forever? The focus of your sorrow is you. That's worldly sorrow, okay? Godly sorrow, and, and let, me, let, me just, let me just emphasize this. Saul said, I've sinned. He confessed he had sinned. If you look at Judas, Judas said, I've sinned. And, and, and Judas even had remorse. He threw the money back into the temple. But the focus of his sorrow was himself. Balaam said, I've sinned to the angel of the Lord, yet God had Balaam judge. The focus of his, his sorrow was himself. Are you seeing this? Godly sorrow, on the other hand, focuses on him. I've hurt the heart of the one I love so much. God showed me when I opened up with Dr. Lester Summerall in the fall of 1984, I was scared this sin of pornography and lust was gonna keep me from the international calling that was on my life to preach the gospel. The focus of my sorrow was me. But after nine months of crying out to know God intimately, to love him as deeply as a man could, He said to me, son, when you went on that fast nine months later, your heart was breaking because you were hurting my heart. That was the godly sorrow that produced the repentance that led to your deliverance. So guys, this is what I wanna ask you. Why do you wanna be free? Do you want your wife to give you good sex again? Do you want to not lose your position in ministry? Do you not want to burn in hell one day? All of that is worldly sorrow. And I can preach to you for the rest of this this course and you won't get free. You have to be really honest. What is your motive for wanting to be free? If your motive is number one, first and foremost, I am hurting the heart of God, then you're gonna get free. If your second motive and almost just as strong as that motive is, I'm hurting the heart of my wife. I'm hurting the heart of my family. I'm hurting the people that are close to me. That's godly sorrow. The focus is on God and others because the number one commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the number two commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the people that are closest to you. So if you're in this course because, man, it's embarrassing, I got caught, my wife made me take this course, or my pastor, my counselor told me to take this course, man, I'll go blue in the face. I'll teach 50 lessons and you won't get free. You have to want to be free because you're hurting God's heart and you love him deeply and because you're hurting the people that are close to you and you love them deeply. I hope you will take the time, and I'm gonna pray, because God will reveal the motives of your heart. And I'm gonna pray, and I'm gonna ask him to do it right now. And I want you to really be honest with your assessment. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brother, my sister, that's watching right now, that's going through this course, we're journeying through this together, your word that will set us free. But Holy Spirit, you're the one 
that can reveal to us what's in our heart. You're the one that can shine the light of truth and love in our heart that exposes our motives. I'm asking that you would show every single one of us the motives for wanting to be free from pornography and from lust. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. I love you guys so very much and I'm so excited because now that we've hit the motivation, now we're going head on in to how to get free from pornography and from sexual lust. God bless you guys. We'll see you in the next lesson.